Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Gus Rodriguez. I'm a practicing gynecologic oncologist and cancer researcher in Chicago. I'm so delighted to have this opportunity to talk about uh, wonderful opportunities for prevention of gynecologic cancer. Um, as we look around today, uh, it's an incredibly exciting time uh, in the area of, of cancer and cancer research. If you look at the wonderful advances in technology that you see around you that are changing the way that we live, primarily related to the Internet, those same types of uh, uh, technological advances are occurring in the laboratory, allowing us to address questions that have long been held regarding the biology of cancer, uh, and um, these are gradually being translated uh, into novel uh, therapeutic approaches to treat cancer. As you look to the future, I think one of the most exciting uh, advances will really occur in the area of prevention, where we will be able to use pharmacologic approaches to turn on molecular programs in cells that clear genetically damaged cells or that destroy cells that are genetically damaged thereby leading to effective uh, cancer uh, prevention. This slide shows the uh, estimated new cases uh, of gynecologic cancers uh, for the year 2014. This is from the American Cancer Society. And um, among these, you can see the most common cancer is cancer of the uterine lining, uh, followed by ovarian and cervical carcinoma. As we look at these, I think that we know enough today to prevent actually the majority of these cancers. Uh, I think we can prevent the majority of uterine and ovarian cancers uh, with a, a pharmacologic approach using hormones called progestins, and we'll talk about that. For women at very high risk of ovarian and uterine cancer, uh, surgical risk, redu risk reduction surgery can uh, substantially lower the risk of the cancers in those women. For the cervix, uh, we have a very effective way to screen for cervical precancerous lesions so we can eradicate them before they develop into a cancer. And we also now have a vaccine that can very effectively prevent cervical carcinoma. And for vulvar and vaginal cancers, the risk factors are probably fairly similar to that for cervical cancer and are likely to be preventable using the same type of approaches that we use for cervical cancer. Shown in this picture is a um, uh, depiction of the female reproductive tract. And um, you can see here, here's the vagina, the cervix, uh, which is the, the uh, mouth or opening to the womb. Here's the uterus, sort of bivalved or in cross-section, uh, the fallopian tubes, and the uh, ovaries. The vagina is covered by skin, just like the skin that covers your arm and your leg, and so is the external surface of the cervix. Inside the cervical canal are glandular mucin-producing cells. Uh, the uterine lining is uh, shown right here, uh, and it's thought that uh, cervical cancers arise primarily from this surface covering of, of, uh, on the cervix. It's about 85% of these cancers. Uh, about 15% arise from the glands here. Uterine cancer, the typical cancers called endometrial cancers, arise in this lining here. Uh, historically, it's been thought that most ovarian cancers arise from the surface covering of the ovary. Uh, but now there's a growing body of evidence that maybe what we've been calling ovarian cancer for a long time has actually been arising in the distal end of the fallopian tube. But essentially, with this fallopian tube ovarian cancer, I think we're talking about the same uh, disease. Now, um, in this country, cervical carcinoma has gotten very little press, uh, and yet worldwide, uh, cervical cancer is a cause of major morbidity and mortality. It's one of the leading causes of female-related, uh, cancer-related uh, uh, death. Um, we know here about that in this country because in this country, most cervical cancers are already prevented because we have a very effective screening method with the pap smear. Um, here are the risk factors for cervical cancer, um, including early onset of sexual activity, having multiple sexual partners, and smoking. These are all related uh, to acquisition of the HPV or papillomavirus, uh, which is sexually transmitted, transmitted and is thought to be the causative agent for cervical cancer. Um, smoking, uh, we think, uh, potentiates or enhances the activity of the HPV virus, making it uh, more uh, virulent. HPV, as I mentioned, is sexually transmitted, uh, and the uh, peak time for transmission is somewhere between the second and third decades of life. Uh, in sophisticated studies, looking at uh, populations of individuals uh, in that age group would suggest that as many as half will have evidence at some point of an active infection. 
In the, in the majority of cases, the infection is cleared after um, uh, one to two years, uh, and um, uh, is therefore what's called transient uh, and not leading to any significant uh, cervical abnormalities. But in 10 to 15 percent of cases, the infection persists uh, and can cause transformation of the uh, cervical squamous uh, uh, skin uh, covering. The number of types of HPV, um, uh, the low risk types uh, can cause end of the warts, and there are a number of high risk types that can cause transformation of cells on the uh, cervix. This somewhat busy slide here uh, depicts uh, in a cartoon kind of fashion some of the things that are occurring uh, related to um, an HPV viral infection in the cervix uh, and um, the transformation of the cervical epithelium uh, leading to cervical cancer. So in the majority of individuals who uh, incur an HPV infection, uh, the inf infection is transient, uh, the virus is cleared, uh, primarily immunologically, uh, and the cervix remains normal. Uh, viral persistence, uh, of the infection uh, remains in about 10 to 15 percent of individuals. A number of viral genes will then cause uh, abnormalities or transformation in cells from the cervix, uh, ultimately uh, causing pre the development of precancerous changes called cervical intraepithelial aplasia, um, CIM1, 2, or in the case of severe dysplasia, CIM3. Um, and then over time, if untreated, this can then develop. Uh, or transform into a cervical cancer. Fortunately, this, this transformative process uh, takes a long time, uh, providing a, a great opportunity over, uh, over many years uh, via the pap smear to allow detection of these precancerous changes leading to treatment and eradication of these precancerous changes so that cervical cancer never uh, develops. Um, and this is done essentially via the pap smear. So cervical cancer is basically a highly preventable uh, 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 cancer. Uh, and when we look at the cervical cancers that actually happen in the U.S. and other developed countries, we typically find it is that the cancers occur not because of a failure of the test, but often occurs because the PAP has not been done. So in this country, uh, approximately half of women that present with cervical cancer have not had any prior PAP screening, and uh, about 10% haven't had a pap smear for approximately five years. Additionally, we now have the HPV vaccine, uh, which is uh, very effective in preventing persistent HPV infections. So again, these are the infections that are the uh, persistent infections that can cause uh, uh, carcinomatous transformation in the uh, cervix. This slide here shows data uh, that were, uh, some of the pivotal data that led to the appro approval of the HPV vaccine in this country uh, again, so, so apologize for the business in the slide, but basically in this case you can see that there was a randomized study comparing um, the effect of the HPV vaccine or placebo, uh, an inert substance, um, uh, and with the endpoint being um, uh, HPV-related CIN or dysplastic precancerous lesions. And this is a this is a um, uh, vaccine uh, that uh, is targeted against. HPV 16 and 18, which are the high risk subtypes and cause transformation in the cervix, and also some of the lower subtypes, 6 and 11, which uh, can cause them to warts. And you can see here that with the endpoint being prevention of these significant lesions, you can see here that the HPV vaccine essentially had extremely high efficacy. Uh, and it's been estimated that if um, uh, young women were to um, uh, receive this vaccine, uh, let's say uh, if all young women were to receive this vaccine, that perhaps 70% or more of cervical cancers could be prevented. So in terms of cervical, cervical cancer prevention, there are a number of uh, things that can be done to prevent the disease. There are lifestyle factors, uh, namely delayed onset of sexual activity, practicing safe sex, primarily using barrier methods um, to uh, help thwart uh, transmission of the virus, and then not smoking, again, because the uh, carcinogens in smoke end up in the cervical mucus and are thought to uh, uh, cause the uh, HPV virus to be more active. And finally, a patchwork screening. Um, and in this country, um, again, the majority of women that present with cervical cancer um, have either not had a PAP or haven't had one for five years. 
Recommendations are that pap smear screening be performed in all women uh, starting around age 21, every three years or so. Uh, for those that are over age 30, the uh, uh, intervals between pap smear lengthen to five years if there's a normal pap as well as normal HPV test, uh, uh, thereby demonstrating no evidence of an active uh, infection with HPV virus. Um, uh, and those women that have an abnormality should be evaluated uh, to rule out a precancerous change of cancer. And HPV vaccine should be considered uh, for all women. The current indication is for those age, ages 9 uh, to 26. In contrast to cervical cancer, ovarian cancer is very difficult to screen for and it remains a significant public health problem in this country. It's the fourth leading cause of cancer deaths among women and it causes more deaths than all other gynecologic malignancies combined. The reason for this really relates to the fact that the majority of women with ovarian cancer present with very advanced cancers, making this uh, a more difficult cancer to treat. doesn't mean that the war can't be won and that these cancers can't be cured, but it's much more difficult uh, to achieve this. Number of risk factors for ovarian cancer shown here, most important ones being a strong family history of breast ovarian cancer. In the general population, the uh, Lifetime risk of ovarian cancer is about one per every 65 women. In those women that have one first relative with breast ovarian cancer, their risk has increased threefold to approximately a one in 20 or 5% lifetime risk. And then there are some that will have a very substantial hereditary risk. Those that have alterations in the ERCA1 or 2 genes or who have Lynch syndrome, we'll talk about this in a moment. Uh, but these are individuals that have alterations in genes that will confer as high as a 20 to 40% risk of developing an ovarian cancer in a lifetime. Reproductive factors include advanced age, not having any children or null of parity, or infertility, and in particular infertility in the absence of any conception. Uh, fertility is associated with a doubling in the ovarian cancer risk, although in those women who are infertile who undergo fertility treatment and successfully conceive, their risk is actually lessened because pregnancy is a protective factor. Inflammatory factors uh, include the use of talc, they thought that talc will migrate up the genital tract and cause inflammatory changes in the fallopian tube and the ovary, um, uh, uh, thereby increasing uh, the risk of developing an ovarian cancer. So we caution against use of talc in the genital region. Endometriosis is a condition where tissue that normally lines the uterus, uh, the endometrium that I showed you earlier, ends up outside the uterus, uh, perhaps leaking out the fallopian tubes in a reverse or retrograde fashion, implanting on the ovaries or in the pelvis and causing a lot of inflammation. Uh, and endometriosis is associated with a, about a doubling in uh, ovarian cancer risk. Protective factors include having children, that's multi-parity, um, breastfeeding, um, which may decrease uh, ovulation, uh, which is one of the risk factors for ovarian cancer. Contraceptive use, which we'll talk about, which dramatically lowers ovarian cancer risk. And we think this may be related to the effect of progestins that are in the pill. And there are surgical uh, interventions uh, that can lower ovarian cancer risk. In fact, any pelvic surgery, whether it be hysterectomy, uh, tubal ligation, these, these interventions uh, will uh, lower ovarian cancer risk by at least one third. Shown here is a cartoon of a normal ovary, uh, perhaps obtained during a woman's reproductive lifetime. You can see here um, a number of eggs uh, developing in what are called follicles. And during each month, a number of these follicles develop. One becomes a dominant follicle, and then ovulation occurs. And this ovary is covered by a uh, single layer of cells called the ovarian epithelium, uh, which is disrupted at the time of ovulation. Uh, and then a healing process will occur to heal this wound. The early factors in ovarian cancer development are not well understood, but it's thought that this process of ovulation and repair can lead to the acquisition of genetic damage in the ovarian surface covering, or that some of the inflammatory changes here uh, can cause uh, cancerous changes to develop in the nearby fallopian tube, uh, and that with the acquisition of sufficient damage, the cancers can then begin to develop. And when these cancers develop, uh, the cells essentially shed from the ovary or the fallopian tube, uh, very much like leaves falling off a tree, uh, and then they uh, spread silently throughout the perineal cavity or abdominal cavity. And as a consequence, of the diagnosis, the majority of women have advanced cancers, um, uh, which are difficult. Uh, to treat. There are a number of strategies that have been in, implemented uh, uh, to fight the war against ovarian cancer, many of which you're hearing about uh, in a number of the other talks for the Globathon. Um, the area that we think has uh, one of the greatest potentials for making a significant impact 
is in the area of prevention where uh, there's a great opportunity using pharmacological and surgical methods to prevent the majority of, uh, uh, of ovarian cancers, and I would say also endometrial or uterine cancer as well. Now, historically, the war against cancer has been fought quite late, and that is to direct all the efforts against clinically evident cancers, um, but uh, the costs associated with this are quite significant. I don't mean financial costs, but I mean the suffering associated with treatment, uh, with the various treatment modalities being surgery, radiation therapy, or chemotherapy. It's now well known that by the time a cancer is clinically evident, that the solid lead that cancer has been present for a long time, in some cases decades, and progress to a series of sequential genetic and molecular transformations during a time in which the cancer is act the cell is actually precancerous and also be becoming a clinically evident cancer. The area of chemo prevention or cancer prevention is an exciting new area uh, whereby um, uh, th this process is targeted, ideally using a pharmacologic approach that either arrests or reverses this process so that the precancerous cells don't persist to develop into a cancer. Now, there are a number of molecular programs that can be exploited for cancer prevention. Um, one of the most exciting ones, we think, is the apoptosis or cell suicide pathway, which is, a genetic, which is a, a, a genetic program that's present essentially in all cells in the body and typically triggered uh, in cells that have uh, suffered irreparable damage, um, leading to the disposal of those cells to then persist and develop into a cancer. It's the most important mechanism that we have naturally to prevent cancer, and it's a biologic effect associated with many known cancer preventive agents. In our research program, our, our goal has been to develop a potent um, pharmacologic approach to turn on this pathway in the genital tract uh, with a hope that it would clear genetically damaged cells, thereby leading to effective uh, cancer prevention. Our work started with a birth control pill, which, as I mentioned before, uh, lowers ovarian cancer risk. It's a very effective ovarian cancer preventive. Routine use of the pill for as little as three years lowers ovarian cancer risk by as much as 30 to 50 percent. The protective effect increases with the duration of use and uh, lasts for as long as 10 to 20 years after discontinuation of use. It's a protective effect that appears to occur in women at average risk as well as those at increased risk for ovarian cancer. So here's our cartoon again of the typical normal ovary in a reproductive age group. Showing some of these follicles and this positive ovulation that I described earlier. Um, because the pill inhibits ovulation uh, and there is a lot of evidence linking ovulation to ovarian cancer risk, it was historically presumed that this was a major mechanism by which the pill was protecting against ovarian cancer. And, uh, notably, the pill would inhibit ovulation. Uh, there would be less damage in the ovarian surface covering or perhaps a nearby fallopian tube, uh, and fewer cancers would occur. We question this presumption because the protective effect of the pill is much greater than what one would anticipate if the only mechanism of action had to do with inhibition of ovulation. So, for example, use of the pill for three years, which would inhibit one ovulation a month or 36 ovulations, comprising less than 10% of the total number of lifetime ovulatory events, lowers ovarian cancer risk by 30 to 50%, uh, much, uh, to a much greater extent than one would expect from just the 10% inhibition of the number of ovulatory events in a lifetime. So we wonder whether the pill might be doing something more profound than just inhibition of ovulation. And to test this hypothesis, we had a remarkable opportunity to study the ovaries of monkeys. These are called synomagous macaques. And these are monkeys that have a reproductive tract and hormonal regulation of the reproductive tract, very similar to that in humans. And um, uh, uh, these monkeys have been on a very large study uh, in which they received either no intervention, called control group, a group that received a birth control pill, typically comprised of an estrogen called ethanol and a progestin leaving or decimal, or one group each receiving only the estrogen component or the progestin component. And after three years uh, on, this, uh, uh, on these uh, various interventions, the uh, ovaries of the animals were removed and, and, and we had an opportunity to examine the ovaries. And we had essentially a laundry list of things we wanted to look at, but given the importance of apoptosis or cancer prevention, it was one of our priority uh, endpoints to examine. And when we examined the ovaries, indeed we found that the birth control pill in a very dramatic way turned down apoptosis in the ovarian surface covering. Um, and um, more importantly and excitingly, we, we found that the effect was specifically related to the progestin component of the pill. Um, this is a, a slide that shows in a pictorial way what I'm talking about. These are representative sections of the ovary in each of the groups of monkeys. 
uh, the control group that got no hormone, the group that got estrogen alone, and the group that got either the combination estrogen progestin and this pure progestin alone. And in this case, you can see the ovarian surface covering the single layer of cells, and the sections have been stained with a biologic preparation that lights up as brown in cells that are undergoing apoptosis. And you can see we saw very little apoptosis in the monkeys receiving no hormones or those that got only an estrogen, but a dramatic activation of apoptosis in the covering in those monkeys that received a progestin. The exciting data let us hypothesize that perhaps the progestin in the pill in a very dramatic way was acting as a classic cancer preventive agent, clearing genetically damaged cells potentially from the ovarian surface covering, thereby accounting for the very protective effect of the birth control pill against ovarian cancer. There's been a growing body of human and animal data that further supports this hypothesis. Um, uh, Harvey Risch in an analysis of data from the World Health Organization looking at um, Depo-Provera, an injectable uh, progestin-only contraceptive, uh, was able to show that, uh, that uh, Depo-Provera uh, dramatically lowered ovarian cancer risk by as much as 70%. Typically, progestin-only contraceptives uh, unreliably inhibit ovulation, so uh, presumably this would be unrelated to an ovulatory effect. Pregnancy lowers ovarian cancer risk, and during pregnancy, there are micromolar levels of progesterone in the blood. Uh, and in looking at the data related to pregnancy, uh, Rossgar and colleagues have been able to apply a mathematical model to the data in which the uh, data would suggest that pregnancy is having a protective effect against ovarian cancer through, through some mechanism that's unlikely to be, to be only accounted for by inhibition of ovulation, but rather that it might be related to something that would be consistent with the shedding or clearing of uh, premalignant cells, consistent with our hypothesis. Um, we were able to analyze data from a cancer and steroid hormone study called CASH, several thousand women uh, uh, who had uh, either used the birth control pill, uh, either of different potencies or had no use of the birth control pill, uh, and we examined their ovarian cancer outcomes. We found that those women that had taken a pill with a point progestin had twice the protective effect against ovarian cancer as women that were taking a pill with a weak progestin. And in fact, a progestin-containing pill was so protective that use of this type of pill for as little as 18 months or less lowered ovarian cancer risk by 60 to 70 percent. And finally, uh, recently uh, we have published evidence uh, of, a, of a, a profound protective effect of progestins in the reproductive, reproductive tract in an animal model um, in the egg-laying hen. Uh, now, one of the largest obstacles to progress in the field of ovarian cancer has been the lack of a valid animal model of the disease. We believe that the egg-laying hen is uh, uniquely suited uh, for uh, for study, uh, particularly for prevention research. It's in, uh, the egg-laying hen develops ovarian cancer spontaneously at a very high rate. As many as the 30s animals get um, ovarian cancer by ages four to six. The tumors um, uh, develop in the ovary. They spread throughout the abdominal cavity and the chicken very much like spread occurs in humans. Uh, we can regulate ovulation, thereby um, uh, uh, controlling for ovulation, which uh, is an important uh, factor which can impact the outcome uh, in any of these studies. Um, uh, and uh, when we study these tumors, they have genetic features that are similar to human ovarian cancer. In a large study uh, with 2,400 birds uh, starting at two years of age, we inhibited ovulation in the flock by uh, caloric restriction. And the reason we did this is that we were trying to prove that progestins would lower reproductive tract cancer risk. Um, but if our intervention with progestins inhibited ovulation, then we would not be able to uh, conclude that it was related to a biologic effect of progestins, but maybe just to due to inhibition of ovulation. So therefore, we restricted ovulation in the flock and then administered progestins in doses comparable to the human equivalent dosages and looking at the impact uh, of this intervention on reproductive tract tumors. And indeed, we found that progestin treatment was associated with an approximately 40% reduction in the incidence of reproductive tract tumors in the uh, chicken uh, with the similar proportions occurring in, in the ovary as well as in the oviduct, uh, opium tube counterpart um, in the uh, chicken. So, so, so these data would suggest to us that uh, uh, progestins are very uh, uh, potent cancer preventive agents in the, uh, uh, in the uh, ovary. Now, endometrial carcinoma uh, is, is becoming a worsening problem uh, in, in this country, 
if we look at the incidence of all cancers, generally they're all falling, um, which is which is uh, great news. But unfortunately for endometrial carcinoma, the number of new cases is rising and the number of deaths is rising as well, uh, which is uh, really uh, quite concerning. Uh, it's not clear what's causing this, but uh, obesity is a major risk factor uh, for uterine cancer, uh, and there are very worsening trends in obesity in this country. Here are a number of risk factors for uterine cancer. I'm not going to go into, into, into detail since uh, Dr. Chad Hamilton will be talking about this in his talk, but obesity increases endometrial cancer risk three to five fold. Uh, and, um, and when one looks at the trends of weight in this country, uh, with these uh, maps here showing trends in ovary prevalence in adults uh, over about a 10, 13 year period between the mid 1990s and mid 2000s, with states in red being states where over half of the individuals were overweight. And you can see that there were no states with uh, a majority of individuals overweight in 1992, and by 2005, essentially the whole country was overweight uh, on average. Um, uh, and a similar numbers uh, trend uh, for uh, obesity. Um, so uh, there's a, a significant, very adverse trend related to obesity uh, and a worsening trend for endometrial carcinoma where obesity is a significant risk factor. Fortunately, we think that endometrial cancer can be effectively prevented, uh, and um, the data uh, for endometrial or uterine cancers uh, for progestins is as compelling, if not more so, than it is for prevention of ovarian cancer. So birth control pill use lowers endometrial cancer risk with a, with a very similar protective effect or proportion uh, as has been seen for the birth control pill in the ovary. Uh, routine use lowers risk by 30% or more. Um, uh, we have shown in a study similar to what we did for ovarian cancer that pills that contain a potent progestin uh, uh, more dramatically lower endometrial cancer risk than pills that contain a weak progestin for those women who are uh, uh, heavier. Um, the progestin releasing IUD, which um, contains a very potent progestin, dramatically lowers endometrial cancer risk. Um, the women that take hormone replacement therapy, estrogens taken for replacement therapy will increase endometrial cancer risk, uh, but the addition of a progestin will neutralize that effect. For women that have developed endometrial hyperplasia or precancerous changes, and even those that have low-grade endometrial cancers, we know that high-dose progestin therapy can actually cure some of these lesions. And finally, in monkey studies, uh, as well as other studies that have been done in humans by other, other groups, progestins appear to turn on the same type of, type of chemopreventive or cancer-preventive molecular changes in the uterine lining as, as those that we have seen in the ovary. Uh, so, for example, in a primate study, we found very similar effects of progestins in the uterine lining is what we have seen in the ovarian surface covering. Now, if you look at all these data, the data that I've described for both ovarian and uterine cancer, the data would suggest that progestins will be very effective preventives, uh, cancer preventives, and that increasing the potency or dosage of a progestin will perhaps um, uh, uh, enhance the protective effect. So there are a number of strategies by which one can enhance progestin potency. Uh, as I mentioned, we can increase the doses of progestin, but that might be associated with an increased risk of side effects. It's undesirable. Uh, a novel progestin could be developed that enhances potency without risk, and uh, there are a number of companies that have been trying to develop novel progestins um, uh, in this regard. Or if one can add a second agent to the progestin, um, uh, and, and if that second agent synergizes with the progestin to enhance the protective effect, and if that agent is safe and non-toxic, then that might be an ideal strategy uh, for enhancing progestin potency without increasing the risk. Uh, and this is an area where we've done a lot of research. There are a number of agents that are candidates uh, uh, as preventives for ovarian cancer that perhaps can be combined with a progestin. non anti-inflammatory agents with aspirin and uh, Motrin, those types of agents. Routine use lowers ovarian cancer risk. Uh, and we've published data suggesting that when combined with a progestin, uh, these agents will enhance the uh, effect of the progestin on cancer preventive molecular endpoints. The problem with ENSAs is that, you know, indiscriminate or too much use can cause um, uh, GI bleeds, uh, and so for the long term, they may not be as desirable um, uh, to, to use. Omega-3 fatty acids, the diets uh, in, in fatty fish or high in omega-3 fatty acids lower the risk of a number of diseases and possibly even ovarian cancer. Um, 
One of the drugs that are, or agents that we've been most interested in has been vitamin D, for which many of us are deficient. Uh, vitamin D is extremely safe, uh, and we have uh, exciting uh, uh, data suggesting that vitamin D may have a uh, novel interaction with progestins, making progestins more effective. So it's an area where we perform some active uh, research. Shown here in this cartoon is a sort of a schematic showing the, the pharmacology of vitamin D. Most people think that they get vitamin D from the diet, for example, in milk or cereal, uh, but in fact, that's a very small component of our vitamin D nutrition. Most of our vitamin D we get from our skin, which makes vitamin D when exposed to sunlight. This vitamin D is not biologically active. It's gotta be modified in the liver. We have something called hydroxylation, it's 25 hydroxy D, which is then further converted in the kidney by an enzyme called 1-alpha hydroxylase to the active hormone called 125 hydroxy D. And historically, it's been thought that uh, this active form of D is uh, important primarily for maintenance of uh, bone health uh, and calcium regulation, etc. cetera. Um, but in recent years, one of the most exciting discoveries has been that many tissues in the body contain the 1-alpha hydroxylase, just like the kidney, and are able to convert the uh, uh, circulating levels of 25-hydroxy-D um, to the active form. So uh, the 1-alpha-hydroxylase enzymes in the breast, colon, uh, over uterus, and immune cells, essentially, and most cells in the body, uh, and um, the, the uh, cells are then able to convert the, uh, the uh, circulating 25-hydroxy-D to the active hormone, where it's thought to play a number of very important roles and regulation of cell growth, cancer prevention, regulation of the immune function, uh, prevention of diabetes, uh, and, uh, et cetera. Now, if there's vitamin D deficiency, uh, then there'll be less 25-hydroxy D that's produced, uh, and therefore a lower amount, not only of the active hormone for calcium and bone health, but also a lower amount of the active hormone that can be around to help with these other uh, wellness benefits of the vitamin. Um, and of course, we're all working all the time, we're all indoors, uh, we're never exposed to the sun, and when we go in the sun, we're covered, uh, or, la or, 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 or covered either with clothes or with SPF 50. Uh, and as a consequence, vitamin D deficiency is, is uh, rampant uh, in our population across uh, all, uh, all socioeconomic groups. Um, so 40% overall in our population, it's uh, most doctors and medical students, um, uh, uh, young women, uh, most of the individuals who are hospitalized and of course most of our nursing homes and it's these elderly individuals who are most prone to cancers of aging such as ovarian cancer and breast and uh, colon cancer. So with less circulating vitamin D, um, there's less 25 hydroxy D that is available as a precursor for these, nut these various tissues in the body to make the active hormone to have a local biologic effect that's uh, uh, preventive against a number of these chronic diseases including cancer. It's been estimated by some that a very significant number of individuals in the U.S. Uh, may die annually prematurely due to uh, cancer and other diseases related to insufficient vitamin D. If you look at ovarian cancer mortality, and this is data from the um, American Cancer Society, with areas of red being high and blue being low, you find this interesting um, distribution in the U.S. Where, whereby the the uh, risk of ovarian cancer or mortality risks are higher in the northern latitudes and lower in the southern latitudes. And in fact, there are very similar maps that one can show for breast cancer and colon cancer and uh, uterine cancer. Uh, and, and for many of these cancers, the farther you are from the equator, uh, the greater the uh, risk and the mortality uh, from these cancers. If you look at the spectral map of the U.S., uh, showing areas where you know sunlight uh, uh, exposure is the highest, uh, in the, these bright colors and then um, uh, lowest in these you know, sort of you know, blue and green colors, you get this sort of sinusoidal uh, spectral map. Uh, this hump or high level here in the south is related to the fact that this is a mountainous area and so uh, there's less ozone that ultraviolet uh, radiation from the sun has to traverse through to get to the Earth's surface. Typically, UVB radiation is absorbed by the ozone layer and doesn't and so there's less that will make it to the Earth's surface. So there's more sunlight over here and lower amounts as you go farther east. And in fact, you can see the sinusoidal pattern um, of ovarian cancer mortality risk in the U.S. Well, there are interesting data that would support vitamin D's protective role in both the ovary and the endometrium, and these data are very similar. 
uh, again, a, an inverse correlation between exposure of UVB ra uh, sunlight radiation and cancer risk. And again, for both of these, the farther you are from the equator, the greater the risk of these cancers. Doesn't matter whether you're in northern or southern latitude. There's some limited evidence that vitamin D oral intake might lower the risk of these cancers. Uh, both the ovary and the uh, uterus contain the one alpha hydroxylase enzyme and therefore, therefore able to convert the active or, or the uh, circulating precursor 25 hydroxy to the active vitamin D hormone. In the laboratory, uh, vitamin D uh, turns down a number of molecular preventive uh, pathways in the ovary and in the uh, 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 endometrium or uterus. In animal models, uh, vitamin D modulates the P10 pathway, P10 being one of the genes that are most commonly altered in the uh, typical garden variety type of uterine cancer. Um, uh, uh, and uh, in this type of model, vitamin D is protective against uterine cancer. These are data from Dr. Hilakivi uh, uh, Clark um, from our consortium using the P10 mouse. These are mice that develop precancerous changes in the uterine lining uh, or uterine cancer. Uh, about two thirds of them will have developed these changes um, uh, by six months of age. In this study, the animals were randomized to several groups, a control group that got no intervention, a group that just got vitamin D. And this is the type that we make in our skin, not the active hormone. Um, uh, and then a group was giving an obesity-inducing diet, um, or OID. Uh, and then a group got an obesity-inducing diet with vitamin D3. Shown here are the percent of the mice in each group that develop precancers or cancerous changes in the uterine lining. And you can see that vitamin D alone didn't appear to do much um, uh, against these tumors. An obesity-inducing diet dramatically uh, raised the uh, incidence of the tumors to as high as 80% of these animals. And in those animals that were given an obesity-inducing diet, vitamin D was very protective, decreasing the development of these lesions dramatically. So this is an animal model that develops an amethyl cancer. And in this setting where the, the animals are given an obesity-inducing diet, very much mimicking what may be happening in the development of human ovarian cancer related to obesity, vitamin D is we're shown to be very protective. And finally, we think that vitamin D may enhance the cancer prevent effect of progestins. We have evidence in the laboratory that, that uh, vitamin D may uh, synergize with progestins of some of these, uh, an activation of some of these molecular changes um, in cells uh, that are cancer uh, preventive. How much vitamin D should you take? Well, the recommended daily allowance historically has been 400 international units. That is uh, insufficient. Uh, to achieve the wellness benefits of the vitamin. You need at least 800 international units per day to achieve good bone health. Uh, and you can take 2,000 international units a day, daily, safely, without any significant uh, toxicity. In fact, some experts suggest you should take even more than that. But if you take 2,000 international units a day, you will not uh, suffer any significant side effects or untoward effects um, uh, and uh, will likely have sufficient vitamin D stores um, uh, in, your, uh, in your body. The best way to know what your vitamin D status is is to actually have your doctor check your 25-hydroxy-D level, and you can have this done by your primary care physician or by your gynecologist. In the remaining minutes, I'm going to talk about surgical prevention of ovarian and endometrial cancer. Um, these are a number of the interventions here. Removal of the ovaries and fallopian tubes called bilateral salpingoferectomy, hysterectomy, uh, tubal ligation, and then bilateral self injector or removal of the fallopian tube. In general, these various procedures are indicated uh, as a preventive intervention, primarily for those women who are at high hereditary risk of uh, these diseases. Uh, although tubal ligation, I guess, confers a protective benefit as a side effect uh, when performed for contraceptive purposes, um, and um, bilateral self-injectomy or removal of fallopian tubes, I think, has great merit for consideration of those women who are undergoing uh, gynecologic surgery for other indications. Uh, because it's an opportunity to potentially lower subsequent ovarian cancer risk without much uh, downside. Now, there are a number of hereditary ovarian and endometrial cancer syndromes, namely syndromes whereby there is a significant uh, incidence of a number of cancers occurring in the family. Uh, the ovarian-specific syndrome associated with a high number of ovarian cancers in various generations in the family uh, occurring as, in as many as 40 to 50 percent of women. This is typically related to an alteration in the BRCA1 and 2 gene. The breast ovary syndrome associated with a, uh, a high uh, incidence of breast and ovary cancers, again related uh, to BRCA1 and 2. And then Lynch syndrome, which typically is associated with a high risk of colorectal cancers, primarily arising in the 
any portion of the colon, uh, and then other cancers, including cancers of the ovary, the uterus, uh, urologic tract, um, um, and uh, prostate. These are related to um, uh, alterations in what are called mismatch repair genes, leading to instability of the uh, DNA. The hallmark for identifying individuals at high risk is primarily family history, um, and, and those that have a significant risk, referral should be made to the uh, geneticist for genetic evaluation and uh, counseling. So risk factors include a strong family history of breast, ovarian, or, or uh, colorectal cancers, um, pancreatic cancer and melanoma as well. Um, typically, many of these confer an increased risk of cancer related to the BRCA gene, but colorectal cancers uh, related to the Lynch syndrome. And oftentimes, there will be many affected relatives, uh, with first degree relatives being most important, so mother, sister, daughter. With hereditary cancers, age of onset is usually young, uh, so less than 40. Um, the presence of a number of these cancers uh, in individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish background um, uh, is, a, um, uh, is a concern uh, in that it increases the likelihood that uh, there's an alteration in the BRCA1 or 2 gene. Approximately one in every 300 or 400 women um, or, or individuals walking around in our population will have an alteration in the BRCA gene, but in those individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish background, it's one to 30 to one in 40. So individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish background with a strong family history or breast ovarian cancer have a substantially high risk of uh, having an alteration in the BRCA1 or 2 gene. The finding of bilateral breast cancers in individuals or male breast cancers is um, it's very suspicious for an alteration in BRCA1 or 2. And importantly, when considering these, these events in the family, looking at family history, both the maternal and paternal sides of the family are important. There are many individuals that believe that it's only the mother's side of the family that matters, but actually uh, the genes can be transmitted in both the maternal and the uh, paternal lineage. Now, for BRCA1 uh, and 2, uh, uh, the, uh, the risk of, of developing cancers of the breast and the ovary uh, increases significantly after about age 40. You can see here, that based on number of studies, the cumulative risk of developing uh, breast or ovarian cancer for BRCA1 or 2. You can see that these cancers are very rare under the age of 40, but uh, the risks are exploded substantially afterwards for BRCA1. Uh, 5 to 10% of individuals may already have a ovarian cancer by age 50. The curves are somewhat to the right for BRCA2, where the uh, average age of onset of ovarian cancer is later. Based on these types of data, the standard of care Guideline, uh, consistent guideline recommendations in, in this country are for those women who have an alteration in the BRCA genes to consider a risk-reducing uh, operation um, when they've completed a family or by age 40 or so. Reason being that it's unlikely that they will have developed a cancer before the age of 40, um, uh, but that afterwards the risk is increasing uh, significantly. Now for those with BRCA2, it's tempting to consider a risk-reducing uh, operation later than for BRCA1. Um, uh, it's unusual to develop an ovarian cancer under the age of 40 for BRCA2 and indeed even under the age of 45, um, but there's no way to know whether this will occur or not for sure. Uh, and, and so currently we're considering, uh, we treat all women in the same way uh, with the same sort of consensus recommendation. There are many studies that are underway uh, nation, uh, nationally and internationally identifying a number of modifying genes that will modify how an alteration in BRCA1 or 2 will manifest in an individual or in a family. And hopefully we will reach a day where we truly have personalized medicine, whereby we'll know uh, based on where the alteration is in the BRCA1 or 2 gene and what other modifying genes are expressed, whether individuals at risk for, are for only ovarian cancer or only breast cancer, and perhaps at what age, uh, thereby being able to better tailor our interventions um, more specifically, but we're not there yet. Risk-reducing removal of the ovaries and fallopian tubes or self-fungal hysterectomy is very protective. This slide's a little bit busy, but basically showing these, these hazard ratios that are low, uh, essentially um, uh, removing of the ovaries and fallopian tubes in women at very high risk, those are BRCA1 or 2 alterations, uh, lowers the risk of getting subsequent ovarian cancer by over 80 to 90 percent. Approximately 2 or 2 percent of these individuals will develop a cancer afterwards called primary peritoneal cancer, which looks uh, like ovarian cancer and we treat it the same way but this is a far cry from as high as 40%. What about hysterectomy? Uh, there are 
some specialists that have advocated that hysterectomy be performed as part of the preventive operation uh, for uh, ovarian cancer. I don't think the data are convincing enough for us to uniformly recommend that at this time. Um, there are some advantages to hysterectomy. Uh, for one, the tubes are, the fallopian tubes are removed completely, uh, thereby removing a, the proximal part of the fallopian tube. Um, and even though there's a theoretic risk, this proximal portion might develop a cancer. I'm not aware of any cases where the proximal stump of the fallopian tube has um, uh, developed a cancer in individuals that underwent removal of the ovaries and fallopian tubes protectively. Um, for those individuals who are candidates for replacement therapy, removing the uterus simplifies hormone replacement therapy because um, those women can then just take an estrogen, whereas if they had a uterus, uh, uh, they'd, have to, um, they'd have to take a progestin as well because the estrogen can cause uterine cancer. Those individuals who are candidates to be on a tamoxifen um, might consider hysterectomy and that tamoxifen can cause precancerous changes uh, or cancer in the uterine cavity, although that risk is low. The risk of getting an amethyl cancer on tamoxifen is uh, 1% over five years. Um, and, and finally, hysterectomy might eliminate the risk of some rare types of uterine cancer that might be associated with a BRCA syndrome, um, but the data here I don't think are conclusive. Um, so hysterectomy right now is not considered um, a uh, required uh, component of the risk-reducing operation, but can, but can be considered on a case-by-case -case basis depending on each individual's risk factors uh, and their unique circumstances related to whether they're candidates for replacement therapy, whether they have some other indications for hysterectomy, and whether they may be on uh, tamoxifen in the future. As I mentioned before, tubal ligation uh, has been shown to lower over, uh, ovarian cancer risk. In the general population, it's by at least 30%. Uh, the data in the high-risk patients, those with BRCA1 and 2 alterations, has been somewhat inconsistent. Um, with data suggestive of protective effect in those that have an alteration in BRCA1 and an effect that's unclear for BRCA2. Um, the biologic mechanism by which tubal ligation may be protective is unclear, uh, but may be related to either a change in the blood flow to the ovary or fallopian tube, uh, or perhaps a, by blocking the migration of inflammatory factors that can migrate up to the vagina, to the uterus, and into the fallopian tubes, causing transformation of fallopian tubes in the uh, ovaries. Now, in, in the very recent past, there's been a growing body of very exciting uh, evidence that suggests that what we've been calling ovarian cancer all along may have actually have its origin in the fallopian tube. Uh, and I described in this slide a number of the reasons for this hypothesis. Um, uh, most uh, ovarian cancers have a appearance under the microscope that looks like the fallopian tube. Um, women that are undergoing risk-reducing surgeries are at very high risk for, for ovarian cancer. More alterations are actually being discovered in the fallopian tube than in the ovary. Um, uh, and when those fallopian tubes are examined, there is an unusually high uh, finding of many molecular signatures that are suspicious for precancerous development or cancer risk in the distal end of the fallopian tube. One of the most compelling lines of evidence, in my opinion, is a finding in cases where there's extensive spread of cancer throughout the abdominal cavity uh, and uh, the presence of a very early, what appears to be a very early lesion in the fallopian tube, uh, that the genetic studies of the fallopian tube lesion and the lesions in the abdominal cavity have yielded very similar findings suggested that they're both related. That would suggest that these cancers that are spread substantially in the abdominal cavity actually were of fallopian tube uh, origin. So this may open up uh, some very exciting opportunities for prevention, um, and some are advocating that perhaps Removal of the fallopian tubes or bilateral self-injectomy be considered for ovarian cancer prevention. And I would say it's, that it's likely to have some benefit. It certainly should be no worse than tubal ligation, which already has been shown to be protective. But at this point in time, I think that we have to consider this experimental and that this approach has not been validated. Um, and we worry that if women assume that this will be sufficient to prevent an ovarian cancer, that some will then present uh, subsequently with an ovarian cancer. That's uh, developed on the ovary. I mean, even if the tube were the origin of all ovarian cancers, it's possible that a cell can shut from the fallopian tube early on in life, implant on the ovarian surface, and then transform later, and taking the fallopian tubes out may not remove that abnormal cell in the ovary that can develop into a malignancy. And so I worry about the missed opportunity that may occur to prevent cancers, given the highly effective rate of prevention that occurs with removal of the ovaries and fallopian tubes according to consensus guidelines.
Also, this may increase cost and risk as compared to the standard guideline recommendations of removing the ovaries and fallopian tubes at age 40, uh, in that if a woman takes her, has her uh, fallopian tubes removed at the age of 30, but still then undergoes removal of the ovaries at the age of 40, since uh, it'd be really unusual for ovarian cancer to occur before the age of 40, she may then have undergone two operations to really achieve the same protective effect. Uh, and so this may be a risk. In a study that's not yet published, but hopefully will be impressed very soon, very large number of specimens that were removed uh, for prevention uh, and uh, an examination of the pathology of those specimens. Uh, and um, in half of the cases where there were cancers, the cancers were localized to the fallopian tube in some way, and half of cases to the ovary. And so the, if the fallopian tubes only had been removed, significant lesions would have been missed that would have been uh, uh, of, 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 uh, uh, localized to the ovary. Just a couple more words about uh, Lynch syndrome, uh, which, as I mentioned before, is associated with uh, uh, high risk of cancers, primarily rising in the beginning portion of the colon, but also these other cancers, including cancers of the uterus, ovary, um, upper uh, GI tract, and neurologic tract. Um, and in looking at the risks, um, uh, cancer risks in the individual with Lynch syndrome, there's a risk of colon cancer of as, high, as high as 60 to 70 percent by age 70. Um, uterine cancer as high as 60 percent by age 70, and ovarian cancer as high as 12 to 13 um, percent. Uh, uh, and so these individuals that have this type of uh, hereditary syndrome, where many of these cancers are occurring in the family, and who have known alterations and mismatch for pair genes, are at very high risk for developing a number of cancers, including cancers of the gynecologic tract. And interestingly, the gynecologic cancers may sometimes precede the colon cancer by, on average, uh, as, as many as five years. And so the, the cancer and the gynecologic tract may be the central event that tips, that provides the tip that maybe perhaps there's something hereditary that's going on. Fortunately, these cancers um, are well-behaved and highly curable. Um, and uh, the typical management recommendation includes close surveillance um, with ultrasound and endometrial biopsy. Um, uh, until an individual undergoes risk-reducing surgery, although this has not been proven uh, to uh, uh, improve outcomes yet. Uh, and to consider removal of the ovaries and fallopian tubes, uh, either via sur abdominal surgery or laparoscopic surgery when childbearing is complete or after age 40, uh, very much as the recommendations are given for those individuals that have alterations in BRCA1 or 2. And this intervention in women that have Lynch syndrome um, is very effective. Uh, this is a study from England Journal of Medicine uh, showing uh, or comparing the outcomes of individuals with Lynch syndrome that had uh, hysterectomy and removal of the ovaries versus those that did not. Uh, and essentially, there were no ovarian or uterine cancers. Those, those individuals that had preventive operations, uh, whereas there were a number of cancers that occurred in those individuals that did not have a preventive operation. So this intervention is extremely protective uh, to prevent ovarian and uh, uterine cancer. So in conclusion, uh, there is great potential to decrease uh, the morbidity and, and death rates related to gynecologic cancer through a pharmacological approach and through surgical prevention. For cervical cancer, the uh, use of the pap smear and vaccination uh, should be able to prevent, prevent the majority of these cancers from ever happening. Uh, and so it's really tragic when we see a cervical cancer in this country, given our availability uh, to use these uh, interventions. And usually when a cancer occurs, it's really because of a failure of the healthcare system to deliver what we already have uh, that's so effective. In the ovary and the uterus, uh, we believe that progestins are very potent cancer preventive agents, and we speculate that a progestin potent strategy may be able to affect, uh, prevent the majority of these cancers. Um, and finally, that in the uh, in, in individuals at very high risk, that a risk reducing surgery can eff effectively, um, for the most part, mitigate these cancers. Um, uh, uh, you know, to, to a great degree. As you look at the number of estimated deaths from the various cancers in this country in 2014, um, I, I believe that it hopefully will be possible at some point to prevent the majority of these from ever happening by way of a, uh, a targeted uh, and personalized preventive approach. I thank you very much for your attention uh, and hope that you'll be able to use this information as a basis for discussion uh, with uh, primary care physicians and gynecologists, uh, hopefully to uh, assess your risk and discuss ways to mitigate that risk. Okay, have a good day.